gonna stand and sing. is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all
No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming out to me. There's no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming out to me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming out to me. There's no wall. Overwhelming, right? You guys can have a seat this morning. Thank you all for being here today. Robert, it's good to have you here. Yeah, it is great to have Robert here singing. I mean, we miss Brad and Danielle, but it's good to have Robert's voice with us today. Let's get the ushers to come up and we'll take up an offering. Remember, don't uh, give out of guilt, shame, or condemnation, anything like that. We're just going to give out of the abundance of our heart. I'm going to ask a blessing over the offering. Father, we're here today to to thank you for all that you do for us every day of our lives, that overwhelming love that comes through Christ Jesus. We're going to give into this ministry, and we ask that you bless both the gift and the giver. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank 
Good deal. I can't hear myself up here today. Oh, that's some good news that they sang about today. Yes. He reigns above it all. Uh, let me get this thing opened up and see where I'm at today. I'm excited to bring you the good news of Jesus. Can you guys believe that we are only one week away from Resurrection Sunday? Easter Sunday, just around the corner. Seems like just the other day we celebrated Christmas. That's crazy, isn't it? Think it. We just celebrated the birth of Christ, it seemed like not too long ago, and it now we're just around the corner from Easter. Time is ticking by quickly. But uh, I got to tell you, I, I can't, the way time ticks by so fast, it doesn't seem like it's been, I don't know, two, three years since I've been standing here preaching. I just, uh, I was thinking about that the other day, is how quickly time moves. We've talked about that several times up here, but I, I want to slow down just a little bit today. We've, uh, you know, we've been talking about kind of the same thing for the last three or four weeks in the same book, the same chapters, but... I want to shift gears for just a second. I want, to, I want to fill you guys in on some happenings around the building here. You see, yesterday yesterday we celebrated a wedding right here at Midland Church. It was, uh, yeah, it was kind of a surprise. It was a surprise to me too <laughs> because it was, <laughs> it was on short notice. The, uh, we didn't even do a rehearsal. It was so short of a notice. Some friends of Pilar and Scotty, they... Uh, they decided they wanted to get married, and they couldn't decide whether they wanted to have a wedding in a church or at a house or whatever, but they wanted to tie the knot, so we opened up the doors and had a good old-fashioned wedding. Right, well, it wasn't old-fashioned, but we had a wedding right here at Midland Church. We had a, a young couple come in and stand in front of a, a group of people and enter into a covenant together, the covenant of marriage. Folks, when I say it was short notice, it was short notice. <laughs> I mean, 
like I said, there was no rehearsal. Pilar contacted me a few weeks ago, and and uh, Lori and I, we just met the, the couple for the first time on Monday night, and this is only the third wedding I've ever done. I mean, I married my daughter, which sounds weird, and then I married my friends, which sounds even more weird, right? So then I married some strangers. Uh, I guess good things that come in three, right? But uh, it's pretty awesome timing, though. Like I said, we, we met them for the first time. We didn't know anything about them. But they stood up here and said their I do's, and it was uh, really pretty good timing, at least for me, because it really goes along with the sermons from the last several weeks and what's leading up to next Sunday. Man, I'm excited about next Sunday. I mean, I know it's Easter Sunday. We get to talk about the risen Savior, but... Today is going to lead into next Sunday. And if you, if you go back and watch or if you've been here, remember some of the sermons that we've, we've done, some of the, the message that we brought, and you're going to see how all this kind of ties together. And it's, I'm going to say it's by accident on my part, but it's not an accident when it comes to God, right? Because I, I didn't put this together. But it really does go along with the sermons, and I'm excited to, to bring you the good news of Jesus today, but before I do... I like, to, I like to recap a little bit. I like to recap a little bit because we've been talking about kind of the same thing over and over and over for the last several weeks. And I'm going to move into some of this stuff because I've got to, have a, I've got to have a path, my path to walk here. I don't want to trip and fall. That'd be bad. But we've been, uh, we've been on the parables of Jesus for the, the last several weeks over in Matthew chapter 13. And we're, we're not going to be in Matthew 13 today. We'll... Maybe a little bit. We'll, we'll see where it goes. But in Matthew 13, Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of heaven and what, it, what the kingdom of heaven is like. He refers to the, the kingdom of heaven. He likens it to a, a mustard seed. The mustard seed is, you know, it's the smallest seed of all. Whenever it's planted into the ground, it grows into a, you know, a large tree, so large that the birds of the air can build nests in the tree even though it's the smallest seed. He also says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a, that a woman puts in the flour. A little bit of yeast causes the whole cake to rise, right? Now, I'm not a baker. I'm not a chef. I don't know how that works, but just a little bit of yeast causes that cake to rise. Christ also talks about the seed and the sower. And... I believe we discovered that the seed is the word, right? The seed is the word and, you know, we're the ground and he is the sower. And through the discovery, we determined that really all the soil does is receive the seed. That's what we do. We're, we're recipients of the seed. When Christ casts out the word, we receive it. We simply rest and receive the word. Jesus, he's the one that does the sowing. And the word does the growing. Which led into the following week. It was titled, the, the Power of Understanding. You guys might remember this, The Power of Understanding. Here's where we found out that, that Jesus was explaining to the disciples that he is the power of understanding. He, he possesses the power of understanding, the understanding of the will of the Father. Christ is the, the light of the world, and he stepped down into darkness. He, he's the light of the world that stepped down into a very dark place. And we often think that that dark place has to do with sin and all our wrongdoings. But that's not what I believe he was meaning. Christ has the, the power of understanding the will of God, and he stepped down into this place that is ignorant of divine things, ignorant of the divine things of God. That's what this dark place is. We are ignorant of the divine things of God. Oh, we like to think we know about the supremely good things of God. I mean, when we know Jesus, it doesn't get any more supremely good than that. But sometimes we don't understand everything that we think we know. I read some scripture yesterday that opened my eyes even more to how ignorant, at least I am, of the divine things of God. I want to chase a rabbit for just a little bit here because 
When I say I read some scripture yesterday, it was during the wedding. I've read these verses before. I've read them before, and I, I, I use these, these verses over in Ephesians chapter 3. Look what Paul says about the supremely good things of God through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, verses 18 and 19, Paul's actually praying to, to, for the Ephesians here. Verses 18 and 19, he says, And may you have the power to understand. Okay, if you, if you have the power to understand something, you have the ability to understand something, then you're not ignorant, right? If you understand things, because that's what ignorance is, you don't understand something. But it says, and you, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And I don't want to be ignorant to the, the divine things of God, especially whenever it comes to understanding how wide and how deep his love is. Verse 19, he says, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Paul knows, he says so right here in this verse, look, it's, it's too much for us to understand fully what the love of Christ really is like. We're going to be ignorant to it because it's so great. We're not going to understand it. He goes on to say, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul, he even believed that the love of Christ was so great that we can never fully understand it. Think about how ignorant of the divine things of God we must be. For the love of Christ is so great for us that, that we, we can't fully understand it. I don't know about you, but... I've never been so happy to be called ignorant in all my life. To be ignorant of how much Christ really loves you. I mean, I, I think I can understand it. I mean, I know he died for me. I know he rose again for me. I know he's paid my debt in full. I, know, I think I know how much he loves me, but I, I can't fully understand it. But Christ has the power of understanding, which, which led into the next week, which was understanding the divine and folks, Christ does understand the divine. He understands the divine things of God. And, and then finally, we talked about last week the parable of the seed and the soil. I titled that message, Old Parable, New Revelation. Old Parable and New Revelation. Anytime you mention New Revelation, oh, I got a new revelation of the word, boy. Look out, because that really puts, that puts a bullseye on you because now you're going to start talking all kind of stuff that you got this new revelation about. Well, like I said last week, just stay with me here and see if you agree with what I'm about to tell you. You all know how you've been taught that parable, the seed in the soil. Probably the same way I learned it. The seed. That good seed's cast out. It's cast out, and only the good ground that receives it is the true Christian, right? He's the one that produces the hundredfold, the sixtyfold, the thirtyfold. That's the true Christian. You got two other backsliders in there, and then you got one non believer. You know, that's the one that fell on the, the path by the wayside, and the bird snatched it away. Y'all remember that, right? That's, maybe that's how you were taught. I mean, that's how you can identify the true Christians of the bunch, right? It's by the fruit they produce. But last week, I give you four examples. I give you four examples of different people that I believe received the word. They received the word. And I got to tell you, that's what, that's what Jesus said, folks. If you go back and read the parable, in each one of the four types of soil, those people received the word. They received it. And if, I, if you receive something, what does that mean? If you receive something, then, then it's yours, right? You've taken it. It's yours. But, but what we do is this. We, we give the devil way too much power. We give the, the defeated foe way too much power. When it, we think that he comes and snatches the word away because that's what we're taught. The evil one comes and snatches the word away. 
But folks, the devil has been defeated. His head has been crushed. So how can he snatch something that wasn't his to begin with? The evil one that snatches away the seed is this. We hear the good news of Jesus, and then we don't understand it because that's what Christ said. They, they hear the word, but they don't fully understand it. They received it, but they don't fully understand it. Like Paul said to the Ephesians, we don't fully understand it. That word evil, we found out it doesn't mean Satan. It doesn't mean the devil. It means full of labors, work. So what we do is we turn back to work. We turn back to our works. We're like, I don't understand how this guy named Jesus could have set me free from sin and death because I know I've got to keep the law. So I go back to living by it. That's what happens. We turn back to our works for our right standing with God. I don't believe this parable was ever about someone being lost or people being backslidden. I don't even think it was about people being saved. It's about people that are in the kingdom of heaven. People have, who have heard the word and received the word, but some of those folks don't fully understand it. People listen, the, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast in a meal. The, the royal power of the universe is a man named Jesus. He's a man that was placed in a moment in time that changed the entire world. He set us free. He sanctified us. He cleansed us. He's made us holy. We simply need to believe in him. And the more we believe, I believe this, the more we believe, the more we understand. And I have to tell you, I... I I was really excited to bring you that message last week. I, I was, man. I was excited to bring you the message. I'm still excited about it. But then I, I realized something. I realized something. Let, let me say it like this. Uh, something was shown to me in a way that uh, made me, uh, I guess, ignorant to the divine things of God. I said some stuff last week that I need to, I actually brought a prop. I brought it up here today. Uh, the title of today's message is this, I brought a broom. Okay? I brought a broom today. I brought me a broom because I got to clean some stuff up. Because I said some stuff last week about a lady that I need to clean up. I said some words last week that I, I need to clean up. Last week, one of the four people I mentioned was the woman at the well. I spoke about her, and I made a statement about her really without even thinking. Actually, it was more of an assumption. It really was. I mean, I just assume things, and you know what you do when you assume, right? Mm -hmm. You may recall that she was uh, the person that I used for the good soil, She's the one that I used for the good soil. I, I said that she was the one that produced 100, 60, 30 fold. She's the person that received the good news of Jesus and went out and produced fruit. And I believe she was. I don't think I spoke out of turn there. I don't think that she could contain herself because she heard the good news of Jesus and she understood it. She ran back to town, leaving her water pot, going to tell everyone about the good news the good news that she had heard. But I made a statement that I got to clean up. I said I wanted to use her as an example of someone who grew a, the 100, the 60, and the 30. And like I said, I believe she did. But I also said she's someone that we could all relate to, someone that we could connect with. And then I read the story to all of you. And when Jesus was telling the woman that she didn't have a husband, the man she's living with was not her husband, that she actually had five husbands before, and the one she's with now, she's not even married to. I, I made this statement. I said these words. Jesus says, you're right. 
I mean, he's accusing her, right? You don't have a husband. You don't have one. You, you have had five. And I said this. You get around, lady. That's what I said. I brought the broom today to clean that up a little bit. You know, I, I talked about new revelation last week, and, and uh, it didn't take long that some new revelation was shed upon that for me. Because, again, I assume things. I said, you get around, lady. And then last week, I'm going to put my prop up now. Y'all remember the broom. Last week, Lori and I was talking. It didn't take long. My wife will line me out. <laughs> New revelation comes from a very wise woman. She and I was visiting. She says, I think you're missing the point of the meeting with the woman at the well. I think you're missing the point of that. You know, you, you, you said it's, you know, the, the woman gets around, right? I'm like, well, yeah. She said that it's deeper than the woman getting around. In fact, she's probably looking down from heaven wondering when people have stopped using her that way. I'm like, wow, okay. I got to have some more of this. So, so I want to share some new revelation with you today. Think about the broom. So let's go over to John chapter 4. Folks, there's so much more to this story. There, and I, like I said, I owe this revelation to my wife. She filled me in on this and... And had me see some things that, that, that bring this story into a much, much, much deeper meaning. And I, I don't think it's an accident that this was at a well. Wells are deep, aren't they? They're deep for a reason. You've got to get down there to that water. I don't think it's an accident that this is a well, at a well. And this well is deep. So let's begin. I would say broom in hand, but I like to add my hands to talk here. John chapter 4, verse 3. He, meaning Jesus, left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So Jesus was traveling along with his disciples and he was headed for this town, Galilee. And they had to go through Samaria to get there. So verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore, being wearied, we don't think of Jesus getting tired, do we? We don't think of that. But he was wearied from his journey. He sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is right around noontime, folks. Right around noontime, kind of a hot part of the day, right? Jesus sits by Jacob's well, tired from traveling. I, I would imagine it's, it's hot. It's close to noon. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. So remember, Jesus is actually at the well around noon, and then the lady shows up. She's not there. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So he's alone there with the lady at the well. And it was around noontime, and a Samaritan woman came to fill her water pots. Now, I've heard this preached a few times. You know, why would this woman come in the hot part of the day to fill her pots? I mean, there's a lot of facets to this story. Why not come in the morning? Well, there's obviously some speculation, and we've all heard stories of that, and I'm going to get into that in just a minute. But verse 9, it says, The woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you... Being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Folks, this right here is key. The Jewish people had no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, I, I thought it was just because they were, you know, half-breed people, half-Jew. That's what I'm thinking. But the Samaritan woman could see that Jesus was a Jew. She knew that he was a Jewish of Jewish descent. And she also knew that Jews didn't have dealings with the Samaritans. That's important. This, this is deep right here, folks. I, I thought I knew why they didn't have dealings with them, but it actually goes much deeper than just simply being, you know, 
half Jew. There's a reason why they're half Jew. You see, the Samaritans, even though they are half Jew, they're, they're part Jew. And like I said, I thought this was the reason why they didn't have anything to do with them, but it goes a whole lot deeper than that. And we have to go all the way back to the book of Kings. We're not going to turn back there. I'm going to explain it to you. But you go back there and you're going to discover why the Jews actually despised the Samaritans. They didn't just not have dealings with them. They despised them. And there's a reason why. A little history lesson. I had to go back to look this up after it was explained to me. I got some light shed on it. But after King Solomon's reign, after, he reign, after his reign, the, the nation of Israel actually split north and south. And uh, they have the north region and the southern region. And the northern tribes of Israel, they were called Israel. And the southern tribes were Judah. And there's a capital in the northern part of Israel called Samaria. And in the southern part in Judah was Jerusalem. Now over time in the book of Kings, you know, all the kings, they did evil on the side of the Lord. And we talked about that several months ago, how the kings all did evil on the side of the Lord, did evil on the side of the Lord, They'd raise up another king. Well, over and over again, the land was actually handed over and they were conquered several times. And during all this mess of being conquered several different times, when the land was taken over, the conquerors would try to weed out the Jews. They would try to weed them out. They would drive them out, try to kill them off, try to breed them out. That happened. When that didn't work, they would try to teach it out of them. Over the course of time, the land up north became Samaria. And the Samaritans had developed their own version of Judaism. See, here's where the, here's where the problem comes in. It ain't just because they're half Jew. It's because they're taking their religion and they're distorting it. They're making it their own religion. They still believe that the God of Israel is the God of all, but they worshipped on Mount Gerizim instead of Jerusalem. And they adapted their own worship practices. That's why the Jewish people didn't want to have dealings with them. It wasn't just because they were you know, half Jew. It's because they were distorting what they believed to be the truth. So... Imagine it like this. If uh, you know, we, we live in the United States, imagine it like this. If we're conquered by another nation, we have our core values here in the United States, right? Some other country, well, I don't know, let's just make up China, for example. They move in and they start putting their values on us. How would we like that? We wouldn't like it. But, you know, they send people in to teach us to be like them. And then, well, that don't work too well, and they realize that because there's uprisings and everything. So they have to meet in the middle somewhere. We'll give them half of their you know, American heritage, and we're going to mix it in with the Chinese heritage. That's kind of what it would be like. All right. So that's what happened, and the Jews are like, man, that ain't right. We're not going to have dealings with these people. So they despise them for it. They despise the Samaritans. In fact, they rejected them. Think about that. The woman at the well is a Samaritan. Jesus is a Jew. The woman knows all of the history here. She knows who she is to this Jewish guy. She knows who she is. She knows she's someone who is rejected by a Jew. But look at what Christ says to her. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Think about that. Jesus perceived that she knew. He knew her thoughts. He knew exactly what she was thinking. He, he knew she felt rejected by him because he knows that she knows that he's a Jew. And the Jews don't have nothing to do with the Samaritans. But he says, look, 
If you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink. And I, think about this, I'm a Jew who rejects the Samaritans. If you knew who I was, you would, you would ask me and I would give you a drink. I would give it to you. But the lady doesn't understand the divine things of God. The woman said to him in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? I mean, imagine being a woman who's sitting at the well at noontime when it's hot outside, drawing water. And some fella you know can't stand you you assume can't stand you because he's a Jew, says he's going to give you a drink. How do you imagine she would have responded to that? I, I think she might have even been a little bit snide. You ever been around someone who you know don't like you and they speak and you're like, whatever. whatever. You, you say that, you don't really mean it. Sir, you ain't got nothing to pull that water up out of the well with. Where are you going to get this water from? Where are you going to get this living water from? This well's deep right here. Verse 12, are, are you greater? I mean, she goes on. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and, and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? It's almost like a, she's throwing it up in his face. Jacob gave us this well. You, you greater than him? Oh, yeah, he is. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. You're going to drink out of this hole in the ground. You're going to, you're going to remain thirsty. You're going to get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Christ explains to her that he's talking about something deeper than that hole in the ground. He's talking about something deeper than that well, something, something deeper that she's about to drink from. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Just imagine her saying, huh? Oh, yeah, give me that water. Yeah, let, let me have some of that. I, I'm tired of coming up here in the middle of the day when it's hot outside and throwing this pot down in there and having to haul the water up. Give me some of that water to drink, please. Like that's going to happen. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you're with now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Right here's why I need the broom. This is why I brought the broom today. I, I made the statement that the woman gets around. You know, she's been married five times, and the, the fellow she's with right now ain't her husband. She gets around. That's what I said, and hence the broom. You see, folks, the real reason the woman was at the well around noontime was that so she could avoid the crowd, right? All the other women would come in the morning time before it got hot outside to get the water, and avoid the heat, but not this lady. She came at noon to avoid the other ladies because she's embarrassed. I believe she's embarrassed. You see, she'd been married five times, and she was living with a man that was not her husband. Now, I thought this meant something else, okay? And it could, I guess. It doesn't really define it. But I thought it meant something else. I, 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 I thought she was a woman that just changed men often. I don't think that's the case. That's not the case at all. You see, the Samaritans still believe in the God of Israel. Oh, they had different practices of worship, but they still believed in the God of Israel. Some of the same laws and beliefs still applied. And did you know that the Jewish law permits a man to divorce his wife? The man can divorce his wife under the Jewish law. Maybe you don't like her cooking. Maybe she can't cook. I don't know. Maybe she can't give him children. Barren. Maybe she's just ugly or unattractive. Regardless of the reason, the point is this. A husband can reject a wife and get a divorce. 
under that law. The wife, however, she stuck. She stuck with the husband. Unless he grants her a divorce, unless she comes to him and says, man, this ain't working out. Will you please give me a certificate of divorce here? Because I, I can't stand the way you smell anymore. <laughs> or whatever it may be. She's not getting a divorce. We're not dealing with a woman who gets around here. We're dealing, mm, we're dealing with a woman who gets rejected. She's living a life of rejection. She can't come to the well with the other women because they reject her. She's been divorced five times, five different times. Now we have to, again, I'm filling in some blanks here because, I mean, those five men could have died, right? I don't think so. Five different times she is rejected by men, men who were supposed to love her, men who were supposed to care for her. And the man that she's with now, he rejects her as well. Think about it. They're not married. He won't even commit to her. He will not commit to her. That's a form of rejection. She is rejected constantly. So here this woman is at the well. You know, last, last week I said, it's going to be something that we can all relate to. We can all relate to rejection, right? Here's this woman at the well, rejected her whole life, talking to a man whom she believes rejects her as well. She's talking to Jesus, who's a Jew, by the way. And she's a woman that Jews don't deal with. The woman said to him, Sir, in verse 19, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So she says, man, we, we worship the God of Israel. We worship the God of Israel here on this mountain. We have done that. But you, you guys reject us. You Jews, y'all reject us. Y'all say we got to worship in Jerusalem. But now what, what does Christ say? Jesus says to her, woman, believe me. This is key right here. Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I, I think Christ is saying to her, look, you're worshiping what you don't know, okay? You're worshiping what you don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you that the time's coming when people, they're not going to worship God on a mountaintop. They're not going to worship God in a temple. They're not going to worship God in a church, not only you're going to worship him in your spirit, folks. That's what he's telling this lady. You're going to worship in spirit and truth. He's going to be with you wherever you go. And the woman said to him, I, I know, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he's going to tell us all things. Folks, she knows about the Messiah. This Samaritan woman knows about the Messiah. She knows. She's heard about the Messiah. She knows what Jesus is saying is true. She's heard it. She knows it. And she knows the Messiah will accept her. She knows she won't be rejected by him. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who you speak to, you am he. I'm the guy. I'm here. I'm the Messiah, he says. At that point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. <laughs> they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? I mean, that, that word marveled. I mean, they wondered, why, they wondered why, they, why is Jesus 
He's a Jew talking to this Samaritan woman who's a woman and a Samaritan. I mean, that's like two strikes right there. They wondered, why, why is he talking to her? Why, why, why is he talking to her? This woman who should be rejected. She was rejected by the Jews for her faith. She was rejected not by one, not by two, not by three, not by four, but five different husbands. And the guy she's living with now rejects her as well. He won't commit to her. The, the women of Samaria, they, they reject her. She has to come at noon because, well, there's a lot of grumblings around when she's there. They reject her. She's forced to come and draw water at noon in the hot part of the day to avoid humiliation and embarrassment. A lifetime of rejected, rejection this woman has lived. I think it's just about all she's ever known. Folks, that well's deep. We can all relate to rejection. I, I ask you can, you, can you relate to that? Can you relate to rejection? Have you ever felt the pain and sorrow that comes from being rejected in life? Here's why the story is at a well. It's because it's deep. It has many, many facets. But folks, they all point to rejection. We can, we can live our lives feeling like we're rejected by God. Especially whenever you're told you're a filthy sinner your whole life. Maybe you feel like you don't measure up. Perhaps you feel like God doesn't love you. Maybe you feel like he can't love you because of the things that you do in life. So you feel rejected by God. Or perhaps you simply don't believe that God could ever accept such a sinner like you. Let me show you who Jesus is. Here's someone who understands the divine nature of God. Someone who understands. That someone is Christ. You see, he's someone who gives the living water freely. He gives it to you. You simply need to believe. Christ said to the woman, believe me, woman. The time is coming and is here now. Folks, you're not rejected. You're not alone. You got a husband that loves you. And his name is Jesus. You, you have a covenant that will never be broken. And, and it's signed and sealed, written in blood. Signed by the blood of Jesus himself. And remember what Paul said in Ephesians 19, may you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. We may not fully understand it, but we can still experience the love of God through Christ. And I, I think... Here's an example of a woman who was rejected her whole life. A woman who's been rejected her whole life, yet she's experienced the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not, not fully understanding it, but still experiencing it. Look, look at what she does. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me, all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Folks, that's the hundred, that's the sixty, that's the thirtyfold, that's the fruit that's produced by someone who knows they're not rejected by the Savior. That's a producer of the fruit. A woman rejected by all but accepted by Christ. That's, that's who we are, folks. I say leave out of here today knowing that you are loved by God. You, you, may not, you may not fully understand it. You may not fully understand just how much God loves you. You may not. Christ rose from the dead for you. 
Christ died for you. You may not fully understand this, that Christ died for you, but he still died for you. You may not understand it. Christ rose from the grave, and he set you free from sin and death. You may not understand it fully, but he did it. We've all experienced rejection in life. Every one of us have. You, you, may, you may be rejected by society because of the way you live. Maybe things you've done in your past. You may be rejected by school or maybe even a job. It could be any number of things. You may be rejected by a spouse, someone who's supposed to love you, maybe even family or friends. But you are never rejected by Jesus. With him, you will never walk alone. As, as a believer in Christ, you are a child of God. So, so today, I, I'm going to say this. Use the, use the broom. <laughs> Clean up that way of thinking. You're not rejected. God's not mad at you. In fact, it's quite the opposite. He's madly in love with you. Father, I thank you for everyone who come out today to listen to what I believe is the good news of Jesus. And Father, we ask that you help us use our broom to clean up, clean up our thinking. Realize that we are not rejected by you. We are accepted by you. And it's because of the blood of Jesus and all that he has done for us. We love you and we thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.